Thank you for joining us virtually today at the University of Waterloo's Faculty of Environment and the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience, or WISER. I'm Sean Gobi, Assistant Professor in the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development, or SEED, Principal Investigator at the Legacy Leadership Lab and Director of Academic Programs at WISER. On April 20th, 2021, WISER and the University of Waterloo's Faculty of Environment hosted a special conversation about the foundations and futures of social innovation with thinkers and practitioners from across Canada and beyond in honor of Seed Professor Emeritus Francis Wesley's induction into the Order of Canada. We hope you enjoy this conversation and please share it with others. The event began with a land acknowledgement from Mulaney Goodchild. Okay, miigwech, Sean. Bonjour, and dinner, Morgan and Duke. Apajigo, miigwech, bezin dawiyag. Wabshkio, get you dark ways and indigenous cars. Waba, nang indigenous cars. Moose, indo dem. Big to gong, nishta, big donjaba, kerigon, zibi donjaba. It's my pleasure to speak to the ancestors and to acknowledge the land where the University of Waterloo is located. It is the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, Anishinaabe Kwayanda, I'm Anishinaabe. And the campus of Waterloo and uh, the University of Waterloo in, Waterloo in Kitchener is located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, which is on the Haldeman Tract, land promised to the Six Nations that includes the, the uh, six miles on each side of the Grand. The UW Stratford campus is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples and is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. When I speak Anishinaabe Mawin, the ancestral language that I spoke in my introduction, I let the ancestors know who I am and where I am and that I am a visitor here to this territory. So today I am in Niagara Falls, Ontario, where I live, and this is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Three Fire Confederacies people. The land acknowledgement for settlers needed to be mandated via the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in order to invite settlers to consciously reflect on their role in decolonizing and healing their relationship, not only to the original peoples of Turtle Island, which is now North America, but also to our Earth Mother herself. To know the land where you are, where you live and work, because that land sings you awake every morning and sings you into dream time every night. That is how our brothers and sisters, the Aboriginal peoples in Australia and the Maori peoples in New Zealand speak about the land. And I, I love when I hear that. So I acknowledge the elders past, present and future and the ancestors of where you are tuning in from all over uh, the world. I know some of us uh, are in different parts of the world and acknowledge the ancestors that travel with you and the land that you all come from. Miigwech, Sean. Thank you, Mulaney. Um, and we'll be hearing more uh, about Mulaney, uh, this is Mulaney's bio, and further reflections from Mulaney uh, later in the program. Now, to host today's conversation, I'd like to introduce you all to Allison Hewitt. Allison is the Vice President of Impact for the Mars Discovery District. And Allison helped develop and lead social innovation programs at Mars, including Social Innovation Generation at Mars. She's also helped start the social finance programs at the Center for Impact Investing, the Mars Solutions Lab, a change lab designed to tackle complex challenges, and Studio Y, an initiative designed to support youth in thriving in the new economy. Allison is also currently a lecturer and former social entrepreneur in residence at the University of Waterloo's Conrad School of Entrepreneurship, uh, Business Entrepreneurship and Technology. So please invite Allison to host today's conversation. Thank you, Sean. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Melanie, for that beautiful uh, acknowledgement. Um, Melanie is absolutely one of my uh, favorite people, and we will be hearing from her a bit later as she offers uh, some reflections. And uh, thank you for grounding us uh, in the experience of our ancestors. So we are here today to honor the most recent uh, inductee to the Order of Canada, Dr. Francis Wesley. Francis, maybe you could turn your camera on now. Uh, Francis is one of the world's leading thinkers on social innovation theory, and this year, when she was named for the order, it was for her contributions to the study and application of social innovation, both in Canada and abroad. 
Uh, Frances, as you heard, is also an emeritus professor at SEED working with Sean, and she was the founder of something called WISER, which is one of the greatest names ever, which stands for the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. And resilience is certainly at the core about lots of things that we're dealing with today. So along with our colleagues, Stephen Huddard, Tim Drayman, and Cheryl Rose, a group of people that are on the first panel have been working together since 2007 in something called SIG. But you'll find out that some of these relationships are even prior to that. When Frances was working um, at the McGill McConnell program, which many of you may know her by, she was also the director of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And she's um, led so many different things. Like some of you may know her from the BRAMP program for her her amazing flagship book called Getting to Maybe, and many others would have just run into her in the graduate program in social innovation at the University of Waterloo. So Francis, thank you, congratulations, and welcome to this panel. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, joining Francis today is uh, Tim Broadhead. Uh, Tim was the President and Chief Executive Officer of the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation from 1995 to 2010. From uh, 2013 to 2014, he served as the Interim President and Chief Executive Officer of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. He uh, retired and he is now um, engaged with social innovation generation uh, as much as we can call him into things. Uh, Tim, would you put your camera on, please? And the final panelist for the first part of our conversation is Al Mansky. Um, Al is a community organizer, social entrepreneur, and an author. Uh, he's been a parent activist in the disability world since his daughter Liz was born. He led the closure of institutions and segregated schools in British Columbia and founded Canada's first family support institute. In 1989, PLAN, or Planned Lifetime Advocacy Network, was founded with his lovely wife, Vicki Kamak, and they brought into existence an amazing social innovation called the Disability Savings Plan. He's received many awards, and both Tim and Al, along with Francis, are all members of the Order of Canada. What an honor to speak to you all today. So thank you guys for, for doing this. And my first question is, how did all of this start, this amazing conglomerate of people that ended up being SIG? Let me uh, give the first word to Francis as our um, guest of honor, and then I will throw it over to the rest of you. Francis. Great, thank you. Um, Tim and Al, you don't have your cameras on, so you might want to put them on if you can. But yeah, I, I, uh, I you know, was part of the, the, founding, uh, the founding group, the founding four, if you will, and um, and obviously this is an initiative that was funded by McConnell Foundation. And uh, I came into it to kind of lead the academic arm of it, which was going to be based at the University of Waterloo. But um, I should underline, uh, before I go back and talk about that, that SIG itself was, social, was called Social Innovation Generation, was SIG, was um, itself a social innovation. And really the aim of the, of the, the whole project was it was an attempt to form a cross-sectional group or sectorial group um, to, in an effort to change the way that Canadians in Canada uh, dealt with or approached change and transformation. And we were looking right from the, the word go through a complexity lens to see whether we could see a shift through our work of political will of different kinds of funding streams. And of course, the first important one was McConnell putting a considerable grant behind this project, but also sort of social processes and cultural views, ideas or mindsets. And, you know, that was, those were our big aims. Could, could we chart that over a period of time? I'm gonna leave it to the other panelists to talk about the difference in funding stream, social processes and political will. My, you know, my particular bailiwick was obviously a change in mindsets and ways of thinking. And uh, so I brought this into the University of Waterloo. It was definitely an outgrowth of the McGill McConnell program and of the book Getting to Maybe, which had already come out. Um, and also a, you know, a deep desire to, throughout, to collaborate with practitioners and funders and, and others besides academia. Um, so this was a social innovation. And you know, even from the point of view of changing mindsets, 
uh, I would feel that it was a success, but it was harder than I think any of us imagined. You know, probably I should have known better, at least one, because I had done a lot of studies of collaborations, which suggests that really successful collaborations are what they call high participation, meaning everybody sticks with it, and high conflict. Um, and we certainly had both throughout the early years of SIG. I think probably more conflict than as a bunch, a bunch of Canadians were prepared for or used to. I mean, we, we were all taken aback by the amount of conflict, but we all stayed and we all hung in there. And I do believe because of that, there was a shift in all our ways of seeing things and doing things. Um, so from the point going back then to what was happening in, in my part of the academic sector, um, I regretted from an academic point of view that we never managed to create what was really a joint pilot project or research project. Because I think that would have brought us even closer together than we thought. But we weren't really able to do that. But we were able to come together around three or more programs that we created coming out of the uh, University of Waterloo. One was the Social Innovation Diploma. Another was the Rockefeller Program, Global Social Innovators Program. And the third was this Banff residency. And in all those programs, we had quite close collaboration between practitioners and academics, both in the faculty, but then of course the participants became a really vital part of shaping understanding. I mean, they contributed to it. It was an ongoing process. And the last thing was we did create a social innovation lab guide with also the intent of working closely with practitioners. From a sheer sort of academic point of view, articles and concepts and theory, there wasn't much in the way of academic theory when we started this process. And I think we made real inroads there, particularly in Europe, South America, and in, in Africa, probably through the, 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 um, uh, the Rockefeller program. We worked very closely with people in Africa around that. And I would say to just off the top, that definition that I gave of of social innovation is having to change, you know, policy, mindsets, processes, and funding streams. This is really a complexity viewpoint. And I think that actually has become the kind of gold standard of how you define social innovation. And it wasn't when we began. And now it's widely used, uh, I think, throughout the world. And so that was a real achievement. You know, we also had the, had the privilege of working with a group of, of young fellows who uh, published a great deal over the seven or so years or seven to ten years where we were uh, wiser was um, in process and now they have all gone on to academic careers in Canadian universities and abroad they include people like Michelle Lee Moore and Per Olson who's going to be joining us and he wasn't part of a fellow but he certainly carried this forward in in Sweden Ola Chernball, Darcy Riddell, uh, Nino Antaji, Catherine McGowan um, and Sean, of course, has been a very important carrying on of this, of this tradition at Waterloo. So they have certainly taken it in new directions and continue to build a body of, of knowledge. And I would say that at this point, social innovation is, a, is an established field in, in social sciences. And I, again, one regret I had there, because we were asked to talk about regrets too, is at the beginning, there was some discussion about starting a social innovation journal. And I wish I had, because I still think there aren't the right kind of outlets for the work that we do. And um, hopefully this will be something that uh, one of the other young scholars will take up at some point. So, you know, it's been, there've been a lot of what I feel like were extremely satisfying results. Uh, a, a very, very stimulating journey with a, a wonderful group of people. Um, and I think we, we did launch something that was truly innovative. And as social innovations go, we made progress on all those fronts. But I'll stop there and turn it over to some of the other founding members to see their view of this. Thank you, Francis. Uh, really helpful. And as always, bringing both the positive and the negative, what we could have done better. And there certainly are lots of lessons there. So thank you for reminding us of that. And we did stick to it. That's <laughs> ultimately, we stuck to it. Uh, Tim, uh, please tell us uh, a little bit about the origin story from SIG, uh, from your point of view. Thanks, Allison, and uh, thank you, Francis. Uh, nowadays, social innovation, the, the term is, is so ubiquitous. I mean, people are, are constantly using it and referring to what they're doing as, as social innovation. It's, it's, it's hard to 
to rewind back to the 90s and to remember that when we started talking about social innovation, it was generally met with just blank stares. What on earth are you talking about? And it's important to perhaps uh, remind ourselves that when the foundation got involved, we weren't trying to focus on something called social innovation. We simply were asking ourselves why so many difficult social and other challenges that Canada was facing uh, were being addressed with the same programs that had shown no great success in the past. Why there was so little room for experimentation or, or testing other approaches. And, and it was really, that was the lens uh, through which we approached what became uh, called social innovation. It was looking for people with new ideas, imagination, creativity, and, and that's how we discovered uh, Al Advansky, for example, and, and Vicky Kamek, and, and other people like that. Uh, Mary Gordon, John Mighton, Anil Patel, Rahul Raj, uh, Ryan Little, and Aaron Pereira. I mean, there was a whole, a whole range of organizations and individuals uh, who were trying to experiment and test and try innovative approaches. And they were having a very hard time getting resources to do this. Uh, there was always money for pilot projects. People love pilot projects, but, but even the pilot projects which showed some evidence of impact couldn't get the money to scale up to, to where they would actually have a significant uh, effect on the problem they were trying to address. And so we looked into this to say, uh, why is this the case? Why is it so hard for people to do the kind of, of constant reflection, testing, innovation, experimentation that in the private sector is taken for granted? Uh, but in the voluntary sector, is there's simply no incentives. In fact, there are many disincentives for people to try new approaches. Um, so that first period of about 10 years was simply supporting a lot of interesting people doing very interesting things. And, and then we stepped back and said, well, we've, we've identified all of these young, as we called them, social entrepreneurs, um, mostly young, um, not all, but how many are we gonna find? <laughs> there are hundreds, probably thousands of people doing interesting things and the foundation can't be the funder for all of these activities. And so we stepped back and said, let's bring these people together and learn from them whether there are common problems that they're encountering, regardless of the field in which they were working, are there patterns which we could identify? And that led to a, a period of two or three years of what we call sustaining social innovation, uh, which is where Francis got involved in running some training programs and, and we were convening a lot of, of uh, discussions. Uh, people like Al and Vicky were very uh, critical in, in helping to organize and design these. And uh, we began to see the first development of a theory of social innovation. Uh, Alison, you've already mentioned getting to maybe, that was built very much on the, on, the, on the experiences of these social entrepreneurs that the foundation was supporting. So there was really that first period of supporting individuals, followed by a period of looking to see whether there were elements of, of, of uh, common challenges that people were facing, regardless of the, the sector in which they were operating. And then that led into the third period, which was the development of Social Innovation Generation, or SIG, which, as Francis said, was itself a social innovation. It was an effort to bring together partnerships, partners from, from different areas, academic, private sector, uh, community-based, and to see whether we could, um, we could ourselves uh, experiment with the idea of collaborating on a deliberate, intentional social innovation, addressing a big, a big challenge facing Canada. And, and as Francis said, we didn't succeed in doing that. Uh, we tried different approaches and I'll leave it to Al and the others to, to carry on from there. Thanks, Tim, uh, fantastic. And I just was reflecting that a lot of those uh, folks that you mentioned end up being Ashoka Fellows. And uh, one of the Ashoka Fellows we have on our, on our panel today is Al Mansky, a senior fellow. And um, as I mentioned before, Al and Vicky were incredible pioneers and, and we relied on them so heavily uh, for uh, grounding us uh, in the experience of the social entrepreneur. So Al, please, let's hear from you about the, um, the involvement, your involvement in SIG in the early days. Well, thanks, Allison. Nowadays, senior is uh, in a company, anything 
that's used to describe me. So thank you for reminding me of that. First of all, I want to I want to toast uh, my morning coffee uh, to Francis uh, for this honor, well deserved and uh, and overdue for sure. I don't know anybody in the academy who gets as much fun and enjoyment and pure pleasure out of working with concepts and ideas and theories and methods. Francis, you were so so instrumental in helping us enjoy uh, the framing that is so essential in learning and moving forward and evolving. So uh, congratulations and, and thank you. Um, my, uh, my origin story, uh, Vicky and my origin story is, is probably um, just these three words just came to my mind. I wasn't planning to say them, but fatigue frustration and, and fantasy. Um, I think Vicki and I were just sick and tired of having successful pilot projects uh, and nothing changing. And uh, people lauding us for having accomplished uh, something that really didn't make a dent in our case in the profound uh, isolation and loneliness experienced by people with disabilities and in the profound poverty experienced by people with disabilities. So here we had this paradox of you know, success in the short term uh, in a very small, small scale and um, no long-term success and in fact an erosion often. So fatigue, uh, frustration at the same old, same old not working, pretty typical, I think of most of us. The fantasy part is, is uh, the allure, uh, you know, of something better, that something could be done better, that there is a way not only to look, but to apply and to act that might get us to these profound shifts that every one of us desire. And so uh, I, uh, I just count that as the most formative moment in my, in my life. And I'm still uh, feasting off uh, the meal that was presented uh, during that period. Um, uh, so, Alison, I'll, I'll leave it at that, except to say, you know, I'm not, I know we'll move on. So I'll say, if I was to do it differently or emphasize, I think that may be the way, I would emphasize the role of culture more. Uh, I think there is something called the cultural determinants of change. Ceremony, acknowledgement of our past, of our ancestors, of history. There's a role for beauty and there's a role for the imagination. There's a role for love and caring. And uh, I would have injected uh, that uh, much more into our uh, way of working and into the way in which uh, we described where we were heading. And secondly, um, and, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that, and I, I want to sound like a reformed smoker, but um, we cannot do social change. We cannot make profound shifts in the structural injustices and discriminations that exist without it being led by the people who are experiencing the issue, whether it's poverty or homelessness or racial discrimination, etc. That, that, you know, is now a given. That, that was not really uh, part of our process. And, uh, and so I probably, I'm not probably, I, if I was to do it again, I would have emphasized that. I'll, I'll let it go. But again, just really, a, 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 I don't know, a tip of the hat, Francis, mm -hmm. to, uh, to you for uh, being such a great teacher and mentor and, uh, and a dear friend that we don't see often enough now. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, what you have done for us and so many people. Love you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Al. You debonair guy, you with a brilliant turn of phrase as always. <clears throat> um, listen, we just had a budget uh, released and in it, they talk about things called social innovation and social finance. And uh, Stephen Huddard, um, who some of you may also see as a panelist, and I were on something called the Social Innovation and Social Finance Strategy 
co-creation steering group. It's a, it's a, a term that just rolls off, off the tongue. Um, but it was also challenging, Francis. Um, it was a it was a tough thing to get through. But we see today the um, reinvigoration of the social finance fund that was mentioned previously, and we see the um, uh, investment readiness program, which is a fifty million dollars being uh, renewed and brought brought back for another two years. So. All of these things were little seeds that were planted. So I'm wondering if anybody would like to reflect on, um, Stephen, I'll ask you like on, on from today, what you're mm. thinking about in terms of the budget. And then I want to quick go around about the future because that's what we're going to ask our other panelists, but I'm really interested in what this group is seeing as the future. So Stephen, maybe you could reflect on the budget. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And I, I was just in a call with the minister, Minister Hussein, just before our webinar started today. and. Um, it was remarkable to see how far we've come in a sense. I think what, what Sig and Francis, what you've done and your work and the work of Al and, and Tim and so many others is just to expand this sense of, of possibility around massive uh, change and systemic change and cultural shifts. So just in the last week, we've had the budget announcement about the 200 million, uh, the first 200 million of the 750 to go into the social finance fund. Um, I shared with, with Tim Draymond and Allison a couple of days ago, the, the new uh, strategic plan from the Canada Council for the Arts, which talks about uh, social innovation, not only in Canada, but globally as a way to engage creative capacities around systemic change in response to the pandemic and the climate crisis and so on. It's just, it's in Al's terms, it has seeped into the water supply and social innovation is now something that I think gives anyone a sense that there is a very proximate and uh, spectacular possibility for, for systemic and, and cultural change around what were previously experienced as very lonely and, and siloed uh, places for you know desperation, hope, and so on. There's now, I think, a, a new a new kind of civic architecture and, and a way that we're linked together around these these huge um, possibilities and that link up with our, our deepest needs, as I was saying. So, Francis, I want to just take this moment to say cheers and thank you for uh, being a, a wonderful source of endless you know, your capacity to listen and, and feedback and hold the space for collective imagining to be open to so many deep possibilities for transformative change. I haven't even mentioned, or I think Melanie might speak to this later, but the way that social innovation embraced indigenous reconciliation in this country and, and found common cause in reshaping our culture, our economies, and so on is yet another example of where this, this, this core ideas, these seeds that you planted, have flourished and created uh, space for, for transformative change. So with that, I'll say, I'll stop. Thank you again. And um, boy, these ideas are so needed now. It's like, it's not over. This is just like the end of, and we worked a while to get you named <laughs> to the, the, this order. Uh, we, we, this is not the first attempt at, no, first run at it, but I think that uh, that recognition so well deserved for you, Francis, and the other SIG principles uh, is, is, I think, a, a good chapter marking for uh, what comes next. We've got lots to do. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Francis, what are you seeing today and where do you see the field going? Is mute. Still on mute, Francis. <laughs> And thank you for doing that. It's a requirement of every Zoom call and we appreciate you took one for the team. <laughs> okay, I think I did it. Okay, but you took your, you took your video <laughs> off. <laughs> All right. There Sorry. we go, we've got it, we've got it. So, um, yeah, where's it going? Well, I, I think, you know, what I said before, but I wish we'd done a pilot project. The reason we didn't do a pilot project because we couldn't agree where we should be doing a pilot project. It really came down to that. There were so many areas of need. And I would say that one of the places that is going is into much more focused activity in different areas that are key, crucial areas. I, I think there's been a lot of activity around environment and climate change that are trying to bring these ideas in. Um, and obviously, we're going to hear from Melanie about the work that's been going on in, in, around Indigenous and reconciliation. Uh, I've been receiving lots of requests and then in conversations about health issues and 
in, and social innovation in health recently, obviously because of the pandemic, and and of, around, of course, the social justice issues, which are so pressing right now. Um, you know, it's really hard to change in any kind of area. And, and I would say that the programs that we did with the practitioners constantly brought home to me how easy it was to sort of say that people should transform and change and how hard it is actually for people who are on the front lines to do that. And yet you see across the country, people prepared to do it, um, prepared to take these ideas and try to put them into practice because they feel the need is so pressing. And I, I guess the last place where I would you know, hope to see this going, and I think I see the first signs of it, is around the interconnection between these things. I mean, taking it to the highest level of complexity where we see how health, health issues, social justice issues, indigenous issues, and climate change, environment issues, they're all interconnected. They're all being pushed by some of the same drivers. And I think this allows people to start to get a hold of what those drivers are and maybe start to intercede at that level. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, Tim, can I have a final reflection for you before we go to our panel? Yeah, I think the danger I see is that, uh, as happens on so many in so many areas, words become kind of emptied of their meaning, of their content. So these days, everything is about systemic change. Everything is about uh, innovation. And the reality is that uh, most of what one sees is uh, is not very innovative and is not likely to lead to systemic change. And, and I think we're only beginning to understand those of us who have been historically in, in rather privileged positions that when we talk glibly of sy systemic change, we're talking about things which actually are extremely hard to do and which are going to affect us personally. It's not just systems that have to change. We have to change individually. And those of us who have benefited from um, whether an accident of birth or, or good luck or, or working in a privileged location like a foundation, when we look at, at what is involved in, in these large issues of reconciliation, for example, or, or addressing the climate crisis, it's, um, we're getting a taste of it perhaps with the pandemic. Of, of how our, our personal behavior is going to be impacted and how we have to voluntarily shift our values and our, our, the, the cultural framework that Al referred to. Um, that's the only way we're gonna find solutions at the level that they're, that they're needed at. So I look at this and say, you know, let's, not, let's not lightly use terms like innovation and, uh, and systems and complexity because um, the more one gets into it, the more one realizes these are leading to uh, very substantial and not always comfortable changes for many of us who have been lucky enough to live relatively privileged lives. That's not everybody, of course. There are many people for whom these changes are absolutely essential. Um, but I think um, change is uncomfortable. Yep, change is uncomfortable, but the current situation is not working. So we have to figure a way out of it and we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable, I think. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. So uh, we're encouraging people to put questions in the Q&A, to use the chat, um, to try to uh, um, think about how the how you want to engage with this, with this panel or with each other uh, going forward. Um, and now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Melanie Goodchild. Um, so Malini is from, is, is Moose clan, um, from uh, Bichigang, Nishnabeg. I don't know if I said that right, Nishnabeg, um, and, um, and uh, Ketagon Sib, 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 sorry, sorry, Malini, you're going to have to help me, my apologies, um, Ketagon Sib, First Nations, which is in Northwestern Ontario, but she is a PhD candidate in social and ecological sustainability at the University of Waterloo and a research fellow at WISER. She is co-founder and co-director of the Turtle Island Institute, which is a global Indigenous social innovation think and do tank. She's also a faculty member at the Academy for Systems Change. And Melanie sits on the editorial board. So this is like what Francis was talking about a journal, but this is a journal of awareness-based systems change from the Presencing Institute at MIT. So in her work, she weaves together her unique perspectives of Anishinaabe, 
sorry, oh my goodness, I'm really, I did practice, Melanie. Gekan um, which is knowledge with systems thinking, complexity theory, and social innovation to address society's most intractable problems. But as someone who's had a chance to work with Melanie off and on over the years, I, I, I just want to say, despite all these wonderful degrees and things, she is such a kind and caring person. And it's always an absolute pleasure for me to have an opportunity to work with her. So Melanie, over to you to talk a little bit about your relationship with Francis and where you see the field of social innovation going. Yeah, miigwech, Allison, and thank you for making the attempt at, uh, at uh, it was good. No, it was really good. Um, so yeah, so bojo and dera mama duk. Greetings to all of my relatives. I am Melanie Goodchild. It's pronounced uh, Melanie, but spelled Melanie, and I'm named after my dad, Delaney, and my mom, Melinda. They halved it up and spelled it uh, like Melanie. My mom keeps telling me not to, to say that they spelled it wrong. Uh, so my dad, Delaney, was a, a survivor of uh, residential school. He went to Spanish Indian residential school. My mom is a survivor of uh, Indian day school. And in 2015, I was working for a national NGO. I had spent seven years before that working for a tribal council called the Shnabi Aski Nation. And that represents 49 First Nations, 32 remote fly-in. I'm thinking we may have lost Francis in the feed. I don't know if maybe I just can't see her. Um, but I did want to um, start by giving a little bit of history of how I've come to know Francis and, and um, the relationship that we have and, and give some context to that. So, so that's what I'm doing now. I mean, it's an honor and a privilege to be here to, to celebrate uh, your induction into the Order of Canada. And as a, a student at Wiser, I've certainly had an opportunity to explore the theoretical side of social innovation, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about how I how I bring that together, the personal uh, perspective that I have as an Anishinaabeg scholar, and the work that uh, Wiser has sort of given me the protective space to do, which I think is really key in uh, how Wiser has supported the uh, incubation we call it of Turtle Island Institute, and so from the perspective of uh, Anishinaabe Gikindasawin, and what that means, Gikindasawin means our original ways of knowing. And in our ancestral ways of knowing, there wasn't a lot of space historically in the Western um, knowledge systems and ways of knowing how we measure data, how we measure data sets, what we call data sets, you know, how we define things. So in 2015, I had never actually really heard of social innovation, systems thinking, complexity. I was, as I mentioned, I was doing disaster response at a national NGO. And then a colleague of mine said, hey, you're a big kind of big picture thinker. There's something called the getting to maybe social innovation residency at the BAMP Center. And I uh, just thought I would give it a try. And I wrote up a proposal about decolonizing the humanitarian sector. That was my project through one NGO and then uh, to the rest of the world, looking at development and, and uh, you know, kind of the philanthropic sector as well. And that's where I met Francis. And I was hooked. I became a systems geek. I am really uh, a systems geek. In fact, unapologetically so, where I, I have to remind people that that's my focus because there's so many other things that I get drawn into um, because of the, the approach that we've take, uh, taken with uh, social innovation. And for me, thinking about the future of social innovation, I think it was actually brought up in 2015 when, when SIG and McConnell uh, supported the Indigenous Innovators Gatherings. Uh, the first one I, I had in 2015, I hadn't heard of social innovation yet, so I wasn't at that one, but I know that Elder Dave Cushane from the Turtle Lodge was there and he spoke about the seventh fire prophecy. So the way that I look at the future of social innovation from my perspective is I take what I need and I leave what I don't from multiple worldviews and, and multiple ways of knowing. So when I studied at Getting to Maybe, when I first heard about things like the Panarchy Cycle, when I was introduced to Basins of Attraction, you know, when I, when, when someone first said, you know, what is the, what is the adjacent possible, you know, that, um, and that definition that Francis and the late Brenda Zimmerman and Michael Quinn Patton spoke about tipping entire systems into more sustainable um, and resilient uh, identities. And I thought, 
well, that's kind of what I've been doing, but I haven't called it that. But it resonated so much with me because Gik and Dasawin, you know, indigenous peoples and many, many nations and, and other cultures around the world, we understand the interconnected web of life. You know, we understood those interconnections. And when I heard feedback um, loops and I heard, you know, these really technical uh, and some of them tools and methodologies, I found it very appealing. I, I really enjoyed it, but I could also see how there was not a lot of space for my own epistemology, as we say, way of knowing worldview and, and cosmology. And so making space for that uh, happened when I was invited then after getting to maybe to become a scholar at Wiser. I'm a research fellow um, on a scholarship at at Wiser, where I've been studying with Francis and, and the current director after Francis retired, uh, Dan McCarthy. And what they ultimately did was give me protective space and niche space to protect the spiritual integrity of the work I was doing, which couldn't be measured in conventional ways. It, it, it had to be protective, it's emergent. Uh, Pueblo scholar Dr. Gregory Cajete describes Indigenous communities as complex adaptive systems with emergent properties. That's probably why this resonated so much with me. And I believe uh, that that's a really good description of, of our, you know, our communities and, and how we are responding to the settler colonialism that still affects our lives of, of what we call decolonization. And so for me, the future of social innovation is, you know, what does it mean for social innovation to inhabit a decolonized um, existence? Like what's the spirit of that? Everything has a spirit. And so connecting to spiritual frequencies, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, is about healing self and systems. And in Turtle Island Institute, um, I recently wrote a paper, my first publication. So Francis is on my committee and is probably pretty happy to know that I have a chapter of my dissertation written in this paper. It's called uh, Relational Systems Thinking. That's how change is going to come from our Earth Mother. And I wrote it with two Western systems thinkers, uh, Peter Sangi and Otto Sharmer, but also with four Haudenosaunee elders. Because I'm here in Haudenosaunee territory, our knowledge is contextual, it is based on the land that we're in. I'm a visitor to this territory, so I sought out Haudenosaunee elders, Dan Longboat, Diane Longboat, Kevin Deer, and Rick Hill. They taught me about the Turo Wampum, the, the way of thinking, and the Turo Wampum Belt, I think, gives us a framework for heading into the future of social innovation that brings together multiple ways of knowing. And so conventionally, you know, maybe I hadn't heard of social innovation. I, it wasn't really accessible to me. I wasn't, you know, studying at university and uh, I was really excited when I read Getting to Maybe and, and some of the other textbooks, Dana Meadows' work. And so in, you know, coming to think about what Turtle Island Institute, which is, a, we, we say we're a global social innovation think and do tank, really we're a teaching lodge. We practice something called Gichiga Kinua Matawin, which is the act of greater deep teaching. That sitting in circle where everyone is a teacher and everyone is a student, you know, less, less hierarchy, a little bit different than some Western academic con contexts. But it's the time of prophecy. And so there's a, a process called uh, Bisca Being, and uh, uh, biscabying, sorry, biscabying, which is about looking back on how you've personally been affected by colonization. And we all have, whether we're indigenous or identified as that or, or non-indigenous, you know, the, the, the concept of biscabying, to go back and look at how you've been affected by colonization and then to move forward in a really positive uh, way, in a very humble way. And I, I want to read a quote from an elder. He's an Andean elder, and he wrote this beautiful book called Deer and Thunder. My friend Minari Ushigu from the Sapara tribe in Ecuador once said something beautiful to a group of people in California. To be an indigenous person doesn't make someone important. To be a white person doesn't make someone important either. When you really see the truth of things, you realize life is a net where all forms of life are connected. This net is the only thing that is important. Indigenous people always feel and express gratitude for being part of this net of life. So if you live grateful, you are indigenous. And he talks about re-indigenizing humanity. And in, in the article, I had the, the honor of writing with these systems thinkers and these Haudenosaunee elders. They talk about spiritual integrity and the re 
vitalization of, of spiritual ways of understanding big systems and doing complex change through that. And so I think, you know, Al mentioned it, uh, Francis, Francis talked about it. What we're really talking about is embedding within social innovation, our models, the structures, the work that we're doing, embedding in an explicit um, anti-oppression, social justice, you know, anti-racist uh, commitment, you know, because uh, there's been some tremendous work uh, done on white supremacist culture. And as an Indigenous scholar, you know, I have certainly experienced microaggressions. I've certainly experienced uh, what um, there's a Hawaiian scholar who talks about epistemic ignorance. Um, Raunu Kuokanen talks about epistemic ignorance which happens at an institutional level. And I've experienced that where the gift of Anishinaabe Gik and Daswin is offered and it's not accepted. Instead, people are threatened and, you know, and, and respond either with, uh, sometimes with hostility and sometimes with a great sense of relief. And I think that's where relational systems thinking, the approach that I'm taking to social innovation, which really builds on so much of Francis's work and others. And I owe a debt of, I owe a debt of gratitude lineage and gratitude, recognition of standing on the shoulder of giants, which I do in terms of my ancestors, in terms of indigenous scholars that come before me, and in terms of Western scholars who were thinking differently, who were presenting us with different mindsets and, and really working to shift paradigms. Um, I stand on their shoulders as a, as a scholar now and you know, writing papers and, um, and giving talks and so, uh, the three pillars of Turtle Island Institute, and then I'll wrap up, I'm timing myself here, Allison, um, is relational systems thinking, rematriation, restoration of the sacred feminine, and healing self and systems. The healing part is really key because when you start to realize that you, uh, to re-indigenize the world, to re-indigenize humanity, to be in a sacred relationship with Mother Earth, the land, with where you are, with your own language, the strength and teachings of language, all of that requires healing. And uh, Tim, my friend Tim Broadhead, uh, just talked about that, you know, to shift systems, we have to shift ourselves. It's not easy to challenge those assumptions, um, especially when they are, they're so hegemonic. And so finally, I think, you know, I've taken quite a bit from uh, the, the theories and methodologies that have come out of social innovation, the work that SIG did and other Indigenous scholars were leading before uh, I came along in, in 2015 to really um, study this. And I'm just going to finish off now by, by sharing a quote here by Kate McKaig, who is the founder and convener of... <clears throat> Torin New Zealand's Evaluation Association and is a thought leader on decolonizing evaluations. And the reason I love the way that she, she phrases this, and this is what I'll, I'll leave with folks in terms of the future of social innovation. She said, it is my feeling that a global agenda or perspective cannot succeed unless we are able to recognize the decolonization work we still need to do to achieve this. Recognition in thought and action, revitalization, preservation, healing, et cetera, are vital to truly transformative collective action in my view. Otherwise, really, we're simply perpetuating inequality, disparities, environmental degradation, et cetera. So I think the future is a place where we practice uh, relational systems thinking is what I've come to call it. And what that is, is just privileging relationships at the core of what we do. Relationships with ourselves, relationships with ideas, relationships with our earth mother, and relationships with each other around the world and all of our relations. The Lakota say mataku yasin, which is I am related to everything in the universe. In my language, I said bojo and dinamaganaduk. That's greetings to you, all of my relatives. And so if we continue to focus on a separation of us in nature and a separation of us from each other, you know, even when we're addressing something like climate change we're going to miss the opportunity to privilege relationships for mutual benefit and really support the continuation of life on Mother Earth. So congratulations, Francis. I love you. Francis joined me back home when on my invitation and so did Tim to come to uh, Bawating, to come to Kitagon Zibi into ceremony. They climbed a sacred mountain. They gave offerings. It's not their culture. But the, I wanted to finish by saying um, 
that I do love you very much, Francis, because you, you, despite your own discomfort and inexperience with, let's go to ceremony, let's climb a sacred mountain, let's listen to Anishinaabe Mawin, let's hang out with elders, uh, that you and Tim and Dan have done that. And, uh, and that's the space that I needed. So maybe sometimes reconciliation is about stepping aside and working collaboratively and giving us indigenous and other peoples the space to to heal and to find out where we can contribute best um, in the global picture. So Apajigo Miigwech Bizindawiyan. Thank you for listening. Miigwech indeed. Thank you so much. I love that you're a systems geek. I think the world needs more systems geeks. We're going to start a whole movement um, around that. Um, I love this concept of uh, relational systems thinking and rematriation and the healing of self and systems. And for folks that are attending, um, you know, we're, we're listening uh, to, to Francis's legacy um, in action, but people taking what works for them and blending it with other things that work for them, their ways of knowing and being and doing. And it's not as if there's a prescriptive one way of doing this. And I also love that uh, Melanie came at this in 2015. I remember when you uh, were in that class at, at Banff and I met you for the for the first time as well. And, and you were really just uh, so willing to absorb these theories and then make sense of them for your worldview and look where you've taken it. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible. And I love that you have found these system thinking, um, uh, I guess, elders like like um, like Peter Senge and Otto Sharmer, and then you've married them with the Haudenosaunee elders, and and what you've brought together is something pretty special. So I am very excited about uh, watching uh, your your career and um, and what will come out of your writings and uh, and where we're going to go. So thank you for um, honoring uh, the the standing on the shoulders of those giants. Really beautiful. Um, Francis, I know that we, we've had some challenges with getting you connected, but I'm wondering if you have anything you would like to say um, in response to Melanie's uh, presentation for what that, that which you heard of it. If we can even get you off mute. Yeah, I, I, thank you. Can you hear me now, Allison? We can hear you, Francis. Oh, great. I really apologize to everybody. You know, we're in a rural area and yesterday we had no phone service and now suddenly today we seem to have lost the internet. So. I, I really regret it, and I, but I was able to hear uh, what everybody was saying because I'm on, on the phone. And uh, I, uh, Melania, it was a beautiful, beautiful statement. I, I was so moved by that, and I can, I can only say that certainly I have, have gained as much from working with you as you have so kindly said you have from working with me. And it, it uh, you know, I do think social innovation is about bringing together these, these new unconnected worlds and ways of thinking and and that ha has been one of the more significant uh experiences for me and sig is having encountered the work that you're doing so thanks so much for that fantastic thank you both so much i'm gonna go to to pair now because of course this time is gonna whip by we could talk for a very long time um but pair olson is the program director and a principal researcher who leads the uh, stockholm resilience center's research on transformations on, to sustainability in 2019 to 2020 he was recognized by the web of science as one of the world's most influential researchers of the past decade. Wow. In addition, um, Pear has decades of experience in working across sectors to mobilize and test theoretical concepts and supports of innovation and transformations in practice. It includes designing and facilitating system entrepreneurship programs, advising CEOs, philanthropic organizations on sustainability transformations, and really creating innovative spaces to combine music, art, science, and policy. <laughs> really wonderful. And uh, Per, you've known Francis for a long time, so I'd love your reflections and some insights on, on where things are going. And Francis, maybe it's easier for you to mute again. Um, great, thank you so much. Per, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this. And what an honor to to uh, to be here to to speak to Francis. And and I, I have uh, all everything you read there is, I. A lot of that I owe to her Francis, my career, uh, and and uh, she has been a, my mentor and, a, and a, a very dear friend. And I've been, she's been helping me and, and mentoring me both uh, uh, my my professional life, but also my um, 
in my private life. So I, I, I owe a lot to, to Frances. And I met her in, in the, the context of a Resilience Alliance, another uh, formed by another fantastic uh, Canadian, Buzz Holling, passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but he uh, then uh, formed this Resilience Alliance. And, and when I came into that space in the late 90s, uh, there was a lot of uh, ecologists. And then on the social side that I was very interested in uh, researching, I, we had Eleanor Ostrom and her Commons framework. And in that, in that sort of, uh, which was, a, was a fantastic to be, be able to work with, 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 with Eleanor Ostrom. But it's when Francis, when I met Francis, this like of so many other I've described here, like uh, it's just a new world open up, right? And an understanding transformation was changed specifically and also bringing in uh, agency, uh, the role of individuals and networks in making change. And that, and that sort of opened up so many doors because I remember I went to one of Ellen Rostrom's workshops in, in, in Bloomington uh, and, and uh, I had a session, it was this early 2000 or something, I had a session on, on leadership and there was a lot of tumbleweed and, and crickets <laughs> in that session because it wasn't sort of, uh, addressed very well, so that's why. Why is such a why was it such a big deal that you know that Francis brought in this agency? For me, it was a huge deal because how can we understand transformative change without understanding the role of individuals and and networks? So so that's that's how I met um, Francis, and she uh, so she has brought in uh, in my world um, methods and and ways of thinking. And I learned about guys like uh, Weber and Habermas and <laughs> uh, all these, uh, all these sort of um, great thinkers. And I, uh, I used that in my research to really focusing in uh, early in my career on transformation and transformational change. And, and the whole social innovation theory has really helped I mean, I, I would say fundamental in, in, in developing that transformation, transformations to sustainability, because that's, that's the field that I, am, that, I, that I am in. Transformations and transformative change that can, that can take us in a more equitable and sustainable directions. So in that, in that work, for example, we, social innovation has been very important for defining transformation. And this is what Tim Broadhead also, and others also talked about that there's a tendency in the, now that uh, transformation is becoming more and more popular as a word. Uh, and, but in many cases, it just means change. And that has been very useful with the social innovation theory to actually define it as a, as a specific type of change, that, it, that includes them changing the systems that created the problem in the first place and defining it as changing practices, rules and regulations, deeper values in, in dimensions like resource flows and roles and routines and power. And also as we, as we also have explore a lot, um, a fundamental change in the relationship to our planet. So it's been, it's been tremendously useful for doing that. And if I should say something about the future and, and what I think about uh, sort of the strengths of, of social innovation and how it contributes to where we're going, especially with, with, the, with the research on transformations, it helps us greatly to explore transformative capacities. And we have, we have uh, together with Francis, we've been developing uh, a framework for looking at transformations as multi-level, but also multi-phase processes that, and that the role of crisis is, is really important in transformation dynamics. And, and in that we are looking at different capacities that are needed in different phases of a transformation. So that's very relevant right now, I think, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this specific cr sort of crisis. We're, we're in crisis 
uh, much of the time with climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, but but it's landed in a different way this one, and and it's really helpful now to use the social innovation theory to help us figure out how do we create the right links at the right time at the around the right issues, and that's that's a phrase I use. That, that's from Francis. That's uh, that also in, uh, involves that people talked about. Um, here also, which I think is is a fantastic contribution, is is how how can we understand voice and representation in those transformative responses to crisis? So if we can stake out new trajectories right now, how how do we make sure that voice and representation, especially from marginalized uh, groups, are are in there? And also leading it, as Al, Al, I love that, and what Al said, that really uh, it's a given these days that uh, uh, those most affected uh, has to be able to lead the transformations. And that's part of the, the field that is really hot right now called tr just transformations. And, uh, and I think, uh, and you let me know, no, Alison, if you just cut me off, if you know, feel like I've been rambling. It's late here, so I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm sort of a, a night, night rambling here. But I just want to mention a couple of things, a couple of places where I think, uh, or a couple of areas where I think it's really uh, where where Francis work and others here have contributed. And that's transformative potential. Uh, that's that's a that's sort of an insight from Frances' book on, on the evolution of social innovation that she wrote with many of it here. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's saying that we need to understand, for example, after a crisis like we have now, is there any way we can sort of say something about the transformative potential of the early responses to the crisis? Because that's gonna be, uh, that's going to be very important, I think, to to establish those early conditions, to uh, understand the potential of them, but also connected them to the de developmental evaluation and, and the blue marble evaluation ideas that also uh, Mike Patton has has been part of developing. And then I think uh, this this uh, understanding the connection between the in, inner transformation that has to happen in order to change systems. I see that all the time, most uh, in research, but also in practice that they're treated separately. And in practice, you'll often see, uh, uh, you know, powerful actors that they want to act and it's like, yes, there's a problem out there, let's change that, you know? And instead, instead they might think about first, what do I need to change in order to actually, uh, um, make constructive contributions to that change. So I think that I just I just want to say something about Sweden because Sweden is is uh, um, is picking up on the social innovation field, and it's interesting because we have a lot of social innovation uh, for many many decades, and we're known for it. In our welfare systems, etc. Uh, and but it's not ha hasn't been a field. It hasn't been a research field with a theory, etc. And it it's, it's hasn't been a sort of a, a, a fear or a practice that has been framed like that. So it's really it's uh, Francis and Weiser and Sig has been really useful to sort of help Sweden along that way. And that's my my job there to to really see to that that knowledge brings in, or brought into that space right now. And because there is always a tendency, especially in practice, to think about social innovation as social enterprise to solve problems. And instead of thinking about uh, systems of, or, or networks of, of interacting change makers that contribute to systems change. So I think that's the, there, uh, this kind of work and the discussions we have now is crucial because I think it's Canada and Sweden are similar, but um, but and I think that we can look at Canada and especially how they formed SIG and these partnerships between academia, public, private uh, actors, and really 
and really sort of look at that model and 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 uh, and really sort of have it to influence the way we are moving forward in Sweden. So I think that's going to be super important. Thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us um, so late uh, in your day. We deeply appreciate that you were able to come and and speak with Francis. We have two other speakers I absolutely desperately want to hear from, and so I'm going to um, ask them to um, to step up right now. Anita, you you are next. Anita is the director of experiential learning at Ryerson University in Toronto, where she's responsible for the strategic leadership and development um, of experiential learning initiatives throughout the university. Previously, she was the executive director of a meal exchange, which is a national charity. And from 2009 to 2014, she was part of SIG at Waterloo. She had lots of roles there, primarily around knowledge mobilization. She helped establish the graduate diploma program and co-created the SIG Knowledge Hub. She is currently pursuing her PhD at, the, at U of T in educational leadership and policy and volunteers with Black North Initiative as a facilitator for the National Signatory Group. So another wonderful woman that we are going to hear from. And um, Anita, if you could tell us a little bit about your relationship with Francis and uh, how, where you're seeing the field going. Absolutely. And uh, let me echo many others. Congratulations, Francis. We are we are not only so proud of you, we know that this has been um, a long time coming and uh, the world is only seeing what we have known for a very long time. And so the utmost of our deep appreciation and respect for what you have done for this field. Um, as Alison mentioned, it was, it was really my privilege and my honor to get to work closely with the SIG at Waterloo team as part of that team in multiple roles um, and work closely with Francis. And our team there was made primarily with uh, there was kind of like a research arm and a practitioner arm. And I think that what, what that did was it really allowed us to, to support and build and vision this work um, from multiple perspectives. And so I was, I have and always will be a practitioner as much as I am a very newly minted PhD candidate as of three days ago. Um, I, I very much have always seen myself steeped in community doing the work on the ground and and champion, championing um, equity efforts across the board. And so when I think about what how Francis has impacted my career and, and the work that I do, the first thing is um, has been mentioned a little bit by Al, I think, but Francis's curiosity um, and love for the pedagogy itself, for driving the field and the theory always was, was a dominant force for us. So when we were planning events, we would be setting up chairs and being sure there was enough food for people and wanting to be sure that uh, that the event went well, that it was received well. And, you know, there would be days where there wasn't as big of a turnout or it was raining a lot or something. And we'd be like, afterwards, we'd be like, oh my gosh, there was only like 40 people here. We're so sorry. We should have done this. And Francis would be absolutely delighted that 40 people had come out on a rainy night to talk about social innovation and was so excited about like what questions had come up, what curiosities were being examined, what we were really furthering around the field. And as I've continued to go through my work, that's something I often think back to about being sure that the perspective that we're holding as we do this work is both bound by the problem we're trying to address, but also that there is this, um, there is a driving force that we continue to return to. And I think that, um, as Tim mentioned, social innovation over the years has almost felt like it has had multiple identities. People define it differently. It is looked at differently. It is, um, it is a point of conflict in and of itself in many rooms that we sit in. And and I think one of the ways that we've navigated that conflict is to be clear about what the boundary is. So rooted in a complexity perspective, understanding, um, understanding the system itself, bounding the problem, uh, some of the terms and the theories we've heard today. But I think that, um, that it's an incredible thing to be mindful of what it is that, that we're really trying to drive forward and the impact we're trying to see. And I think hearing Francis speak to some of the regrets um, are, are not only shared things, but also remind us that there was never um, any impression that the work that we were doing was perfect. It, we knew at the very least it was far from that. Um, but one of the terms we often talk about was the work that was necessary and yet not sufficient. So recognizing that there was always space for, for what was to come, the conversations that we were leading to. Um, when I think back to 
the other thing I'll say quickly before I just speak to the future of social innovation, I know we're running out of time as we always do, um, is when I think to, I, I had the privilege of seeing Francis in multiple rooms with funders or government officials, other scholars, uh, practitioners at the front of a classroom at, the, at a board table. My favorite place to watch Francis was, was with our SIG fellows, was investing in the future research of this area and doing that from a teaching lens. So I always thought, you know, our team was made up of practical academics and academic practitioners. So we had these tensions, but with the SIG fellows, there was this real role that we could see of really furthering the clarity and the thoughtfulness of the theory of social innovation and recognizing that we were at a chapter uh, within SIG, within social innovation in Canada that Francis was leading that was about furthering the thought leadership around social innovation. And I think that moves me into some of the future of social innovation, but I think what we heard Francis speak to, but I think where we're seeing some of the possibility now, especially as a practitioner is this ability to move deeper now that we understand some of the framing, some of the boundaries, some of the discomfort that we are being asked to, to sit in, in those tensions, there is this invitation almost to step into the work from each of our own problem areas or from each of the ways that um, we approach things from an interconnected or interdisciplinary approach. So, you know, there is this, we know that um, we are past the point of knowing that, you know, it's not that the system is broken. The system is working beautifully for those that it was created by and those that it privileges. And we all hold a responsibility in how we uphold the current system or how we work to dismantle it and ensure the alternative is ready, right? As we talk about basins of attraction, but how do we ensure that the alternative is ready um, as we see these injustices and these inequities across our education systems, our public health, our housing systems, we see it. And so how do we hold the hope that um, that allows us to work in these interconnected ways? And I think that the theory of social innovation has allowed us to, to move forward with this complexity way, but it encourages us, us to think about how do we work across sectors? How do we work across generations? How do we work across our own comfort zones? And how do we do that in a way that allows us to sit in the tensions, embrace the discomfort, you know, very early in the definition of uh, social innovation uh, in Canada, we talked about vulnerable populations as part of our definition. And, and I think that was one of the areas we didn't really get enough time to dig into. We didn't really talk about, we, we, talk, we, we always put it up on a slide. And then when we would dig into it, it was this real question around, how do we see inequities and powers play out? Where do we see privilege in our system? And how do we, how do we tackle that? And I think that it's incredible to feel like uh, not only do we get to, to honor and celebrate Francis's contributions and leadership to getting us to this point, but for me personally, to know her personally, and as we've heard on this call, uh, she is someone who has invited so many of us into the room to say, here's what I think, take it where you will, build on it, make it better, it is necessary and it is not sufficient. And so where do we go from here? And so Francis, I love you. Thank you so much for, for everything that you've invested in me personally and professionally, and for, for what you have done for this field and for the future of social innovation. We are, we, are, we are indebted to you. And while we know it is not perfect, we know that there is space to move in. So I'll send back to you. And you are muted. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't want to make Francis look bad by doing it on her own. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very kind. Uh, Jerome, thank you for your patience. Um, really uh, excited to hear what you have to say. So for folks who don't know Jerome, he is the lead strategist and he's an innovation consultant um, for the word Buffalo Strategy Group. So he specializes in strategy, human-centered design, organizational development and facilitation. He helps leaders get to better solutions using that design thinking and community innovation that's centered on empathy. So he was a 2018 social innovator and change maker, and he's a champion for equity, for diversity, for inclusion. He really leads work around BIPOC, low income and rural communities. And Jerome, I believe you were a student of Francis's at, at one point as well. And we're super excited if you could just say a few reflections on your relationship with Francis and where you see the field of social innovation going. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Allison and everyone, um, and the organizers of this event. Um, Francis, I want to say congratulations. Um, a big, big hug um, and uh, um, the work well done. Um, and, and, and so proud that you're being recognized for all your achievements in this journey around social innovation. Um, for me, um, I was part of the Banff um, residency. That's where I met um, Frances um, first. But before I met her, actually, part of the requirement of the, the residency was to read Getting to Maybe before you actually got to Banff. And so I was able to start to see her ideas and who she is um, and, and, and to then start to have an understanding of her journey, um, but with also my journey. Um, and, and so what for, for me as a, as a person, I, I, I was born in Jamaica in a fishing and farming village um, in Clarendon, Milk River, Jamaica, where my grandmother would say, um, the water's so rich, um, it looks like milk. And, uh, and, and, and those teachings um, that, that, that was, those seeds that were planted in me. Um, my grandfather was a farmer. Um, he had 200 cattle. Um, he had uh, 300 goats. Um, and grew crops, bananas, plantains, onions, tomatoes, scotch bonnet peppers um, that he would uh, sell at local markets in the village um, in, in Jamaica. I, I plant that with honoring and recognizing where I come from. Um, my ancestry also goes back to the Sahara Desert. Um, I'm from a nomadic tribe um, that, was, that would be um, identified in common day Chad, uh, Northern Nigeria and uh, Northern Cameroon. I have to anchor myself with that history to be able to then come to where we're at today. Um, in the Banff program, it provided me a space to learn the language and th that Francis, as the lead instructor, provided understanding of positive deviance and feedback loops and farmers don't grow crops, they create the conditions to grow crops. And I would always think back to my grandfather that would play reggae music um, and he would always joke and say, it helps the plants grow <laughs> in, 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 their, in, in their farm and in their village. Um, and, and just the power of, of the, those seeds of, uh, of that knowledge. And so now coming back and in, in being in the Banff Center, um, realizing and working as a collaborative, bringing together so many individuals um, in, the, in the field to support them to get to the next level. And, and Francis would plant the seed and say, you know, her, she's passing the baton to us um, to, take it to, for, to take it further, um, to take it wider, um, to scale and grow um, when necessary, but to more than anything, be mindful of also the negatives that come with um, the work of shifting and transforming communities because systems change and retract. Um, it's, it has a shadow. Um, and so it's important to always uh, minimize blind spots and understand that in systems, as you try to change them, um, they will also repel and shift in different ways as well. So it's not always good when you're challenging and transforming systems. Um, that's important. We're recognizing and seeing um, things now um, in the current day of wanting to run to solve these challenges. But I think one of the lessons that Francis has provided is don't run to solve right away. It's important to learn, to listen, to measure twice and then cut once. Um, I remember uh, Francis's grandson um, that was, uh, she would bring her grandson to, to Banff and he was making a drum and he actually sat beside me when we were making the drum. And it just reminded me of how important that uh, change making starts early. It starts with multiple generations and we have to be intentional in, in that teaching and in that learning. And so I, I will continue to carry the work. I will continue to carry your teachings, um, uh, Francis. Um, I will be, uh, I'm part of the Wolf Pack, that 2018 um, uh, social innovation BAMP residency, and, 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 and I say hi from all of them as well. And, and, and one of the key things that um, I really want to highlight um, that, uh, that I learned in the BAMP program is not to be afraid of power, not to be afraid of diversity, not to be afraid of tackling injustice, because it, because it is challenging. Um, in the fight. It is, it is a storm on the ocean. It's not a walk on the beach. And so it's really understanding to use those lenses of complexity um, and, and systems um, to be able to understand and slow down the complexity that's occurring in injustice, um, in environmental um, challenges, in poverty, um, in race relations. And so that's something that I've always kind of kept um, with me. Um, where do I see the field going? I think the field needs to listen more to people that have least power in our society. 
because we know that those that have the least power um, are usually the closest to the solutions. And so it's incredibly important for us to anchor ourselves in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we need to partner and collaborate um, with the unlikely suspects. And we need to provide um, more opportunities for those that are championing this work and pushing this work. Um, and it's also important to be able to step aside um, to provide a hand up, um, not just a hand out um, in the work and um, to be able to move um, the sector forward. We also have to recognize that we need to collaborate with the best from every sector. And we need social innovation to be part of the toolbox of every expert, every leader, every champion change maker that's in our communities um, so that they're using um, that work, that collaborative diversity um, to be able to move us forward and to foster the change that we want because we can't do it um, by ourselves and we can't leave it to just government or just social service leaders or business leaders and how important that is. I think the last thing I would say is um, we need more people playing in, in the sandbox together that don't look like each other. Um, that doesn't have similar life experiences, doesn't have similar ways of knowing um, and stories. Um, it's important for us to anchor that, um, anchor our, our, our difference and, and celebrate that. That's part of us as a humanity, um, as, a, as, a, a large, as a larger world. And lastly, we have to acknowledge trauma within the system and that social innovation um, must be, we must name it, own it and try to solve it. Um, and then center on healing and culture to be able to help us move us forward. And so I leave with those pieces. I see the sector um, as their significant opportunity um, and social innovation can play a significant role as well. So thank you. And congratulations again, Francis, your teachings and lessons um, are with me and our cohort in the Banff and we continue to push forward on the work that you've done. Beautiful, thank you, Jerome. Thank you um, everyone for those uh, wonderful acknowledgements of Francis. And it's true, right? I mean, all these little phrases that we heard, even, you know, a sense of the possible. It's amazing how often I, I use that when we're trying to give people hope. Um, Francis, I wanna turn it over to you to reflect uh, on what you've heard and, uh, and wrap us up. It, there were also a, a bunch of questions, unfortunately, because everybody was so eloquent, we didn't get time to get to them. So if any of the panelists are capable of um, and willing to answer some of the questions in the, in the, in the chat box that Sean has been posting, uh, if any other panelists, if any other audience members feel like answering, please do. We certainly don't believe um, people who've been on camera have all the answers, so please, please answer. Francis, over to you for some concluding okay. comments. Thank you, Alison. Um, this has been amazing. I'm really sorry I couldn't see all your faces, but there's a way in which when you just sit and listen to, uh, it's, it's very, very touching and moving. So I wanted to thank everyone for your congratulations. It's, it's, this has been such an honor to, to be here today and to hear all of you speak, um, but also your incredibly articulate statements that all of you made that just um, moved me so, so deeply, both you know, in my head, uh, but also in my heart. And as usual, whatever I'm exposed to this group, uh, I just learn new and important things every time. And so um, I have listening to you today. So, you know, I want to thank Tim and, and Al and Allison um, just for, for, you know, all the support and for Stephen too, all the support over all these years. And also for really challenging me at times when I needed to be challenged. Now, uh, it's, it takes, a, it takes um, you know, a certain kind of person to, to both work with you and be a collaborative and a supportive, but also to call you on it when you need to be called on it. And, and that's been some of the more profound learning experiences of my life. So, you know, I, I, I am forever grateful for that. And thank you, Anita and Pear and Melanie and Jerome. Um, give me these great gifts. You know, you all mentioned that, you know, you learn things from me. Well, you know, nothing can be more gratifying to a teacher than to hear that. And, and yet, you know, I'm always aware that what a great gift attention is, you know, uh, it, what a great gift you, you give just by receiving, you know, what I had to offer um, so graciously and, and for carrying it forward in your own ways. You know, it's, it's it, you know, I had a mentor, Ulysseal, who used to say, you know, if you want to change things, you, you have to be prepared to shed things. And what he meant by that is you have to have the trust to put it over into the hands of the people who are going to see the future with it. They're going to carry it, even if 
if they go off in very different directions, you know, that's what needs to happen for something to grow and change. And, and I feel that listening to each of you, uh, the sense of, you know, great gratitude that, that you are there and you are going to take it into the future. Um, and of course, I wanted to thank Sean and Geraldine and Allison for doing all the hard work of organizing this and facilitating it and, and thinking, even thinking of doing it. And I can't really close without just, you know, extending a, uh, a tip to the people who aren't here, like Cheryl Rose, who all of you know has, you know, been, many people said, you know, the heart of this enterprise and, and uh, you know, the gifts she gave. And of course, of, of our, our late colleague, Brenda, you know, she, she so infused the understanding of complexity and complex systems change that, uh, that we brought to this program and, 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 and really initiated in me a passion for trying to find a way to take ideas and make them into something practical for, you know, the passionate people who are out there trying to change the world. A number of you are on this call. You know, I really miss her every day. And you know, I, during this pandemic, I've thought of her so often about how so many of her insights could be used uh, in the healthcare profession. She was making inroads into that before she untimely had to leave us. But, you know, I just, I think of her always with a, with a, a great sense of gratitude. And I know those of you who knew her feel the same way. So, Thanks again to all of you. It's, this has been a wonderful afternoon. Um, uh, I just appreciate it so much. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Francis. And we're coming up right up against the hour. Um, uh, I too will add my voice of the deepest congratulations. Your words come out in what I say and do almost every day. It has uh, been an absolute honor and I'm so glad that you got the recognition you deserve. In addition to the, the initiation of this um, from Wiser, uh, Sean's work, uh, Geraldine's input, all our incredible panelists. And I also really want to recognize, <coughs> excuse me, Tim Draymond, who ran SIG National for many years and was instrumental in, in helping keeping all those people at the table. And finally, I want to thank all the audience members. Um, thank you so much for your questions. I'm so sorry we didn't get to them, but we will follow up. Uh, an absolute uh, pleasure. It makes me miss uh, sitting around actual tables with all of you when I'm reading these comments and I'm inspired by you all every day. And so may you all stay safe. Uh, may you all get the vaccinations and may we all find an opportunity to be in the same room again someday soon. Congratulations, Francis. Lots of love. And uh, a final uh, thank you to Allison for hosting this event for us today. Um, it's been a wonderful uh, conversation and thank you for holding the space so well. Uh, of course, uh, a final thank you again, uh, Francis, for your wisdom and your lifetime of work so far. Uh, and of course, being a, a wonderful mentor uh, to me as well. Um, so I uh, just wanted to end us off by uh, thanking you all again for attending, for joining us today. Uh, the event has been recorded and so it will be available to share with those who are unable to join us today. Um, and uh, uh, we encourage you to do so uh, when it is up and we will be following up uh, with an email to provide you a link with that. So once again, thank you all, uh, be safe and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Sean. <laughs>